I think for a while I've been thinking about, you know, what does it mean to root church planting in God's story? Um, I've been a church planter since I was about 18. I'm now um, much older than 18. And next year I celebrate my 50th birthday, God willing. And um, when I first began church planting, I wasn't trained. I wasn't coached. I really didn't know much about what I was doing. So um, it's been a long journey of discovery. And one of the things I discovered quite quickly was that as I tried to find different ways to go about church planting through you know, trial and error, I realized I was kind of running from what we call pillar to post. I was just trying to do anything that would try and help me form this congregation and reaching out to people. And probably it was about four or five years into church planting when I began to really take a step back and think about, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? How does this connect with God's mission, his call in my life? I began to ask, uh, I guess, what you call like theological questions. I began to reflect more on what it meant to church plant in connection to the story of God. I've been kind of brought up with, you know, church growth theory about just, you know, starting churches to get more and more people to become Christians and and evangelistic strategies and a whole bag of tools. But I didn't ask that deeper question as to how, how was I participating in God's story for the world? And that began a quest that has um, continued for many years. And over the last um, four or five years in particular, I've been able to write and reflect and teach um, what it means to root church planting in the story of God. One of the things that uh, I love is uh, movies or films. And my favorite um, trilogy of films is Lord of the Rings. And uh, I mean, I better be careful not to talk for the next you know, 30 minutes about Lord of the Rings, but it's just a fantastic story. The thing I like about Lord of the Rings is that it's unlikely people that are in quite amazing and sometimes unlikely adventures. But what they don't know until kind of as it grows on them in awareness that they're actually caught up into a story that's much bigger than themselves. In fact, one of the critics who was um, first reviewing uh, the trilogy, Lord of the Rings, says this, those who head out on the journey find themselves caught up in a story much bigger than themselves. And that phrase really kind of resonated with me about what I was doing and uh, and how I discovered, you know, what church planting was, was not just about planting church per se. The church planting is not an end in itself. And in fact, there's nowhere really in the scripture that tells us to plant churches. That might come as a shock to some of you maybe listening and watching. But actually, there's something bigger going on. And when I think of the analogy of Lord of the Rings, we have all of these little characters who are in, in the micro picture, I call it, day by day or journeying on the adventure from the Shire for their mission of destroying this ring. And they, they kind of live that out day by day through story after story after story after story. And all of their little adventures belong to something that's much bigger than themselves. In other words, all of their micro adventures, the various things they do in this quest and mission, are all part and parcel of a much bigger story that's at work. And sometimes they grasp it and sometimes they don't grasp it. Sometimes they see it, sometimes they don't see it. But those that are watching, those who know the story, know that actually they are caught up into this adventure that is somehow shaped by their little stories and also shaped by the bigger story. That's how I think we need to think about church planting. The church planting isn't just about, you know, me in Manchester doing a church plant and that's the story. It's my story. It's my micro story. And anyone who's planting a church, it's part of their story and it's an important story and it has a contribution to make to a much wider picture. But actually all of us that are following God and seeking to really understand God's story for the world are caught up in something much bigger than our own little story. In other words, what I really want to make clear is the big story shapes all of the little stories. And the little stories 
are part and parcel of the big story. And in my first several years of church planting, I couldn't see anything other than the micro story, my little story, my struggles, my weaknesses, my inability, all the things I learned the hard way. And that story was important and is important. But when I realized that my story, alongside countless other stories across the world, across the cities, across the nations, that actually all of those little stories together were part and parcel of a much bigger story that God was interested in, did that really begin to help me understand not only what I was doing, but put church planting in its proper context. In other words, church planting, it was to avoid, you know, methodology or be bogged down by or reduced to methodology or anthropology or sociology or cultural studies or activism or pragmatism or strategy or church growth. All of those play a part. But if church planting is about those things, it misses its essential heart. There's actually about being caught up in God's big story for the world. And that everything we're trying to do and achieve and express in forming new communities is all about the God who's working in his community of creation. And that everything about you know, what God's about is about what we should be about. And when I understand how God is part and parcel of his world, that actually it's the big story, if you like, the cosmic picture about what God's up to. We might call that the kingdom of God, or we might call that in fancy theological language, God's eschatological picture of what he wants the end to be, to be brought into life now, is when we realize that that's what we're about, that big adventure that God's actually working in and creating himself, that when we align ourselves with that, that's where church planting finds its place. I guess it's why the Bible doesn't tell us to actually plant churches. When I say that to students and so other practitioners, they say, yeah, but the Bible's full of church planting. Well, of course, it's full of church planting. It's one way in which we share the story of God. But actually, even in the Great Commission, which is often seen as the, the church planting text, what we find there is actually no explicit call to plant churches at all. What we're told there is to be caught up in God's good news story and to share that story with all of the nations of the world. In other words, we are custodians of a message and a ministry that is universal, cosmic in scope. And as we go and as we share that message, in response to that message, communities are formed and lives that are changed. So we're not about church planting for the sake of church planting. Church planting is one missional expression of what it means to share the story of God to all of creation. And in response to that story, people come to faith and communities are formed. That's what we're about. Alan Hershey is a good friend of mine. He works at Forge and with me and a number of others. He said, we actually plant the gospel. And when we plant the gospel out of the seed of the gospel, communities are formed. In other words, it's not just about planting churches for you know, denominational reasons or for more numbers or being pragmatic or being actively driven. That's not the essential thing. The essential thing is planting that story of God, the gospel, the good news story, and in planting that, in understanding our participation in that big creation story, to people respond to God's good news and communities are formed. And I think once I make that the heart of everything I do, it takes on a different thing than um, what church planting is in terms of what I'm trying to do. It, it's part of God's great big cosmic story that I'm involved in. Um, someone said to me the other day in the bus, what do you do? And I said, um, well, I said, what do you do? And they said, well, you know, I'm a banker and I, I trade in money and I trade money here and money there. And, you know, I arrange business deals and it was so very impressive. And I said, so what do you do? I said, well, I'm engaged in storytelling and participation in the cosmic transformation of all things. They went, wow, that sounds like an amazing job. And actually, that is what we're about. And one of the things that's not being done well is 
to please church planting within, I guess, a theological framework. That's what we're really talking about. The story of God as a theological foundation. That we're not driven by all of these things that have to be done on the ground. And I love strategy and I love methodology and I love culture. I love sociology. And these are not unimportant. But fundamentally, church planting needs to be rooted in, in these theological roots. Has a theological heart. Has a theological foundation that our micro ministry is transcended into God's macro picture of his big story for all of creation. Over the last um, seven years, I've been writing a doctorate, a PhD, which I think you do for your sins. And obviously I've taken 10 years to do it, which means that my sins are even greater than the maximum I was allowed. And I've been reflecting on this big story of God and trying to train and coach people and work to say, like, what we're about is not about our denomination. And what we're about is, is not just about strategy and vision and about being creative for the sake of being creative. Actually, what we're about is bringing that little taste about what God wants the end to be into what creation is now. Like, that's what we're about. It just changes everything for us. I used um, a chapter in my doctoral thesis to try and express this. And for the next kind of 18, 20 minutes max, I'm just gonna outline some thoughts that hopefully get us stimulated in our thinking and in our questions. What does it mean to be caught up in what I would call the story of God's creation? You see, that's the big story that we're caught up into. Church planting will only make sense when we place it within I believe the great story of God's creation, redemption, and new creation. Like that's why we do what we do. That's the essential heart about what motivates us and shapes us and informs us about what it's all about. In this chapter, I dialogued with um, a theologian who is German, who's actually still alive, and his name is Jürgen Moltmann. Jürgen Moltmann in evangelical circles is sometimes seen as a little bit dodgy, and I don't know who's watching and what traditions you come from. I suspect broadly evangelical. And I loved him. And there's some things he says are completely, oh, I think, weird and wacko. But then again, my sermons are a bit like that. But he says brilliant things about creation. And as I dialogue with him and read his writings, there were seven things that I just want to kind of hang as things that we can talk about that he said are so important about God's story of creation. As he talks about this in his book, Trinity and Creation, he tries to say that what God is about is embracing the world that he has created and that everything God is doing in his story for the world is rooted in his creation and redemptive care of all of the people in the world. And what he says about God and God's story in the world, um, I just want to share with you with some kind of headings and say a little bit about each one because there's seven, and um, I haven't time to obviously go into those. The key thing is to kind of get the basic picture. What do you say about evangelicals, inc incidentally, and he often placed himself as an evangelical broadly, was that they needed to move away from being preoccupied by church to being more preoccupied about God's creation narrative. In other words, in theological language, we need to move away from being ecclesial-centered, centered about church, like it's all about church, 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 to actually place even our doctrine of church within a wider picture of God's cosmic creation. And so he said our whole missional agenda shouldn't be just shaped about what church is about. The church itself should be shaped about what God's purposes for creation are about. And in fact, if we want to be church the way God wants to be church, then we need to actually understand what God's doing in creation. Because only as we understand about what God's doing for his whole creation, should we actually find ourselves aligned with purposes that God would want his church to be involved with. So here are seven things that um, I deduced from reading him across his writings that I found very helpful as a practical church planter and to root the thing I'm, I'm, I'm practicing in, in something much deeper and bigger than my little micro story. And that excites me and it hopefully inspires you and inspires others. The first thing he says about God and creation, his big story, is God's creativity. 
And, you know, we love when we see the world all around us, the, the, the beautiful creations God given, has given us. And we see the creativity of so many people and so many things. And we can't look at the world and not see this amazing creativity that God has let us kind of partner with. But somehow part of the image of God means that we are co-creators with God. And one of the things that Jürgen Moltmann says is that when we think about the purpose of our lives, then part of our purpose in our life, if we follow the story of the creator God, is all about us, is to become little co-creators who are working with God in creating the things that are beautiful and creating the things that are new and being involved in bringing to life things that are dead that actually we are creators, little mini creators with God. And that whatever else the church should be about, it should be about creativity, not for its own sake, but creativity um, as part of the expression of what, mean, what it means to represent God in the world. And we celebrate kind of creativity wherever we are. The second thing that he says is that God's, um, God's creative heart and his story is really reflected in God's hospitality for the world. Um, Jürgen Moltmann talks a lot about God's oikos. That's a, a Greek word meaning home. And when he says the amazing thing about God is he makes his home with us. And Jesus says that too in his teaching, you know, that the spirit comes and we make our home with you. And the idea is that creation is like God's home. It's like God's house. It's like God has not stayed in heaven, but come down to dwell with us in his house. That God is so hospitable that he welcomes everyone in creation to dwell in him and he in them. That actually God says, this is like my home and I invite you to participate and share in all the beautiful resources that I've provided for you. That my world is a place that can become your home, your oikos. And one of the things that Moltmann says that I've been thinking about in the story of God is that whatever else we're about, it's about setting up God's home in the world. In fact, it's about joining God in offering hospitality to all of God's creatures and, and all of God's creation. It's about welcoming everybody at the table. It's having a room and a place for every person. It's saying that actually God is so interested in every person in his world that he's made room for them and offers them the generosity of hospitality. The third thing that's linked to that is this idea of relationality or friendship. That not only are we made in the image of God to be creative, but actually the most important thing that we are made in the image of God for is relationship with God and relationship with one another. In other words, at the heart of being a human being is the, the ability that God has given us to have relationships and friendships with other people and with the wider creation itself. That we're called to love creation and we're called to love and the whole animal species, that all of it belongs to God and all of it is about friendship with God, friendship with one another and friendship with the world. Now, friendship with the world, I don't mean in a sense of New Testament perspective, where it means we love worldly values. We're not talking about that. We're about recognizing that, that all things God created is good. And just as Noah kind of put in the boat um, his family and like a whole representation from the animal kingdom, that actually God calls us to be stewards of friendship to everything and everyone in the world. In other words, what Moltmann says is that being made in the image of God is essentially about being a relational friend. Um, I love the story of Enoch where he's called a friend of God. And I love the story of Jesus when he gathers his disciples around him and says, you know, I no longer call you servants, but I call you my friends. That friendship is the greatest gift that we can give to others. And friendship is the greatest thing that God invites us into. In other words, at the heart of God's story of creation is a story of friendship. Yes, that was broken, but is restored. But at the heart of what we're about is about relationship with other people. It's not about people being products or about being consumers. It's not trying to make a buck out of someone or, or trying to create some big monopoly that we're building or some empire. It is about being a friend of God. It is about being a friend of creation and one another. 
The fourth thing that I love about what I read in, in Moltmann, this part of God's big story, this big meta-narrative, is God working in the world, identifying with suffering, and identifying with those that are poor, those that are destitute, and particularly for those that are experiencing trauma and difficulty of life. In other words, those that feel they have got no hope. The one other thing that God does by entering into the world in Jesus in the incarnation and by sending the spirit into the world, the one who groans with us in the world, the Christ who is crucified for us in the world, the crucified God, as Moltmann's, one of the Moltmann's book is entitled, and um, another book, you know, which is simply called um, The Future Hope, represents his idea that God comes alongside us in the world, in our own brokenness and in the brokenness of the world, and works in Christ, the crucified one, and works in the spirit, the groaning one, who come alongside us and give us this anticipation that life can be better, that this is not the end, that in our suffering, there is a place in which we can have renewed hope for a better future, that this God of all creation is going to actually bring about a scenario where there is hope and restoration and renewal and new life and those that suffer will be you know brought through into a new glorious future and Jürgen Moltmann um, has a lot to say about this idea of hope and one of the things that is important in God's creation narrative to understand is that we join the Holy Spirit in like being ambassadors of hope hope in broken places broken lives for God's big story is about bringing hope to the world. Remember three things that endure, faith, love, and hope. And on earth, we are hope givers to all of us, to all of our communities. We are about being ambassadors of hope. The thing that he talks about is this idea of diversity and unity. And the idea of creation, of course, is that God is, you know, fantastic, the one who's throwing lots of diversity, different cultures, different peoples, different races, obviously different genders. He's, he's so diverse in what he's doing. He loves diversity. But as a God of order and a God of harmony and a God that brings together diversity and unity. And so in our mosaic of working with different cultures and different peoples and different groups, we love to not only be homogenous in our work in church planting. We love diversity. There's something suspicious when everything looks the same. When one church looks the same as another, it's just, what's going wrong there? The creativity is diverse, but there's a unity within that diversity. And so one of the things that I feel that we do is that we embrace creativity and we embrace diversity, but we also find unity within diversity. We don't find uniformity. We don't either embrace division, but we do embrace kind of unity and diversity hand in hand because it reflects the nature of the creative God. I think that's helpful for our churches. The last two things he talks about that inspire me are linked together. One is that God is the life giver. I mean, that's essential. And, you know, the whole thing about creation that God breathes into, you know, the first creatures he breathes into the first human beings. The spirit of life is given, that life is sustained by God, that all of life is upheld by the breath of God and the word of God, that God is about life. And one of the things that that means is we're about life. We're, we're about a reverence for life. We're about bringing liberation. We're about bringing freedom. We're for the things that give life and we're against cultures of death. Why? Because God in his story is creating life. And that leads to eternal life, of course. His whole agenda is about bringing life. And so whatever we're doing, we're about bringing life. It means we're about challenging everything against life, cultures of death, addiction, destruction, sin. Those are the things that we are kind of warring against with the Spirit. Why? Because God in his story is a life giver for all of creation. The thing that I love perhaps most about Moltmann's work in the book, God and Creation, is this amazing observation that actually the seventh day of creation is the crowning moment of creation. Until then, I kind of thought, well, yeah, creation pretty much ended on day six. God's done his work. And I didn't really think about the significance of day seven. And what he talks about is how <laughs> day one to six, God is busy. He's busy doing 
he's busy, busy making things and he's a busy doing all these creative things I've told you about. But on day seven, which is the high point of creation, he rests. He basks in the glory of what he's made. He's no longer active and doing, but he's being in his creation. He's giving it a hallowed rest. He's giving it a space where people can enjoy being in the presence of God, worshiping him, and just having that posture of, of kind of not only relaxation, but recovery, and enjoying doxology, the praise and glory of God. And this crowning moment, this Sabbath, is the high point of all of God's creation. It's not, you know, the creating of mankind and womankind. That's not the end point of God's creative thing. He creates Sabbath, which is a space for days one and six to find their identity and their belonging and their purpose of being in God and enjoying God for who he is and worshiping God for all that he has done. In other words, doxology is the crowning moment of creation. And being in a very active evangelical denomination and being a church planter where it's all about doing, 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 and working with pioneers that are burnt out, how the doctrine of creation, the story of God needs to be heard as a place where all of the doing gives way to relational being with God, basking in God's glory, rejoicing in doxology of worship and appreciating the beauty that God has created. The crowning moment of creation isn't days one to six. It isn't actually the doing. It's the being and finding our identity of being in God. So as I kind of sum up thinking about this big story of God, God's big creation story, it gives me a whole new dimension as to what I think church planting is about. It gives me a whole idea of what church is about, what my life is about. And so let me kind of put church planting in this kind of language and maybe not call it church planting, but by what I'm going to say, I want it to be church planting. I'm going to call it communities. Imagine if actually what we're about is this. We're about forming communities of creativity. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing that we're about? What about if we were about forming communities of hospitality? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing that we would be about? What about, above all else, we were forming communities of friendship? That actually, that's what we were about. Creating communities of relationships in which people matter most. What about if our church plants were called communities of hope? That what we were about was hope giving in the world, that bringing hope into the darkness, walking along, alongside those who are suffering, saying what we're for more than what we're against. What about, what about being communities of hope givers? What about being communities of diversity yet unity? Communities where we embrace a mosaic of cultures and forms of doing church and so many different expressions of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And yet, having that harmony and unity that brings us together. What about creating diverse, unified communities? What about if we were about communities of life? Communities that are for life, that are for a reverence of life, that are for freedom, for liberation, for everything that brings wholesomeness to people's lives. What about we were life creator communities? What about, finally, if we were communities of Sabbath giving, communities of recovery, communities of rest, communities of doxology, communities of praise, communities where the glory of God was the most important thing we're about. So when I come now to talk to my young adults, I say that we want to be about church planting. I want to to raise it from the level of strategy and vision and growth to actually say, what about it, guys, about joining in God's big story of creativity, hospitality, friendship, hope, diversity, life-giving, Sabbath existence? Do you fancy want to set up a few communities like this in the world? 
I think that that's what church planting is. I think we need to place it in something that's bigger than what it is. Church planting is not about church planting. It's about joining in with God's big story. And the seven features I've given you today are just the beginnings of what it means to join God in his macro picture and express all of these seven things in micro pictures where you're found wherever you are in your own context and setting. Let's place church planting in the big story of God and in all of our many adventures. Realize that we too are caught up in a bigger story than we could ever even imagine. But we also play our role. And one day we'll see our place in that story and how that story has unraveled into the most perfect and beautiful story of all. Thanks for listening and I'm looking forward to dialoguing with you and your questions. Well, Trevor, that was absolutely amazing. Really, really inspiring. And I just, because I know that people who are listening to us now and people who will listen to this talk later, <coughs> many of them will be church planters. And I think just what you shared with us tonight will take pressure of people to actually to perform, to, to succeed, and actually just, you know, kind of, I, I loved your talk about the doxology of worship and everything that, that you tell us about how do we root church planting God's story and how that is the most exciting bit about it is really brilliant. So we have, we have, well, there are loads of questions, loads of things to tease out. But could you just tell us first, how, first, how did you get caught up in church planting? And then what happened to change your perspective? Um, I think that, um, I think when I became a Christian um, at about the age of 18, I, um, I had a natural passion for wanting to share the gospel. Um, I was passionately against Christ. I was, um, I was, I journeyed from atheism to agnosticism to surrendering to Christ. I had a dramatic conversion. And in a moment of conversion, uh, the first and only thing I wanted to do was share the story of God with everybody. And so that's what I did. And I, everywhere I went, um, I just shared, you know, through testimony and maybe bad methods, crazy ways of doing it that weren't so good. And I really came to journey in that place where I kind of thought, that's what I'm going to give my life to, sharing the gospel of God. And as I began to realize that was the passion and conviction, um, I found myself doing some theological training in Manchester. And then from there, I went into um, a, a local church in Scotland, where one of the things they were wanting to do was create a new church. And they said, what we're looking for is a, a couple of you know, young adults, of which I was one, who just like have a passion for sharing God's story, who really want to be involved in the community and making relationships and, and give their lives to sharing the gospel. And they're going to get paid for it. And I went, you can get paid for doing this. So I actually joined this church planting team. I wasn't trained. I didn't really know what I was doing. And um, I went with my wife and my uh, you know, young son. We burnt ourselves out. We um, were full-on activists. We were full-on trying to do this, trying to do that. For a whole pile of mistakes, which I could go into, but I won't, unless I need to. We just kind of came to a place where we thought, there's a there's got to be some framework here we can work with and it's then that i realized i actually needed some training i needed some coaching i needed some pastoral support i needed to find yes some strategy but i also began to reflect on actually what is it we're trying to do i felt great denominational pressure to plant the church to get members to get converts to get them tithing and those are the things that were driving us that i never felt comfortable before and it was at that point I began this reflective journey and said, God, what is it that you're about in the world? And my journey's taken me through, obviously, writing formal theological studies. But actually, those are the turning points when I began to think, God, what, what are you up to about in your creation? And those seven things I've said began in an embryonic form. And then I began to say, whatever else we're about, we're not about planning a denominational brand. We're not about just trying to get bums on seats. We're not about trying to force people to become Christians. What we are about are the things I've shared with you. And when we start to orientate ourselves around that, our church plant went from chaos and discouragement 
into a very flourishing community because people out there are looking for communities like I've described. And it's when I began to see that, then I began to say, that's what we need to train. That's what we need to coach our church planters into, that they need to get the, they need to get the right motivations and the right story, not the denominational thing. Even though I respect denominations, I respect systems, they need to get what God's about in the world. And if they get that, God will take care of the rest. So that's kind of how I got into church planting. I, I guess an accidental church planter, I fell into it as, as something that I felt naturally fit it to. And I developed along the way through many, many mistakes. As I continue to plant churches in Manchester, I don't make old mistakes, I just make new ones. <laughs> and so I'm constantly learning on the way. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. And can you just, talking about training and how, how did you start, can you just give us a specific example of one of the churches you, you, you planted and how this understanding of, of rooting church planting in the story of God has made it look different? And how did you then, for the team that you had, how, what did you do to train them? So um, yeah, I'll, give you, I'll just give you a, a, a yeah, first example comes to mind. Um, so when I was first church planting, I basically copied the forms of church I'd grown up, I, that I became a Christian in. So when I became a Christian in Belfast, when we were trying to start a church, I thought, well, we'll just do what we did in Belfast. But of course, Belfast, like every city, has got a very unique way of doing things. And I grew up in a very, very conservative church. It was like, you know, you stand up for hymns. And so I thought, well, we'll just, we'll just do what they did because that's what you do. So then I realized that actually that's, um, not, that's not so, that wasn't the way to do it. And that just didn't fit. So as then I began to think through, actually, what does it mean to form communities that actually shape the context? So um, the most recent church plan that we've developed is in something I would never have done when I started 20 years ago. It's a community that's primarily for Muslims in um, Manchester, um, in a place called East Didsbury. It's 70% Muslim. Um, for a long story, we've been building relationships, you know, offering hospitality, friendship, those things I've just talked about, to this Muslim community um, through their children, where I began to do some work in a Muslim school. It's a miraculous story how I get in there. But actually, the school invited me to come and, um, and be a friend to the school. They said to me, could you be a friend and offer a Christian hospitality to our Muslim neighbors? And I went, well, you can understand. Yeah, that's what God's up to. So what we realized very quickly was that we needed to find a way to try and live out faith, engage with Islam in a way that kept our, even, I'm an evangelical, kept our evangelical core, um, but recognized that God was a work in the Islam community, that we were being offered, you know, joint hospitality, there was diversity, and trying to say, what does it mean for this team to be planting a church across cultures in ways we'd never done before? So we all took ourselves, including me, um, into um, a study of Islam, we um, began to um, attend some mosques, um, not primarily to worship or anything like that, but to understand a culture of Islam. Um, we went to a center for Christianity and Islam to get trained in not being ignorant about, you know, because you know, we were crazy. We knew nothing about Islam. What I kind of knew was from the Daily Mail. That's a paper in Britain, which is just like crazy. Sorry, was anybody who loves the Daily Mail out there? I'm sorry. But you know, this right wing Islamophobia stuff. And so we had to learn the doctrine of Islam. We had to learn their stories. I had to learn their cultures. We had to learn how they ate food. None of these things, you know, were ever a part of our lives. So we spent about a year preparing what it meant to not offend people in hospitality, in eating, and what it meant to be clued up to offer hospitality in ways that were genuine friendship. And that's what we began this, to do. In the school, we offered through actually shared art because we had we a number of artists and they used ways to use drawing to bring the children and families um, in that school together. And we used um, murals that we created kind of connections with. And out of that, we began to develop um, relationships with a whole series of Muslim children and Muslim, um, Muslim parents. And our training included all of the things I said, theology, learning practical skills, 
about how to you know interact socially with um, Muslims, how to understand Muslim hospitality, how to understand you know food rules, family traditions. So our team of five people got trained in all of those things, and if we didn't, we would have set back the work maybe forever, or we would have missed the opportunity and blew it greatly because we weren't skilled. In, in the culture that we were working in. So every church that we plant, someone asked about how many churches, we, I've personally planted about nine churches and seven in Manchester in the last seven years. And what we do with all of our trains is, is train them in the big story of God, and then we train them practically in how they can live those things out with cultural appropriateness in the Definitely. form of diversity that needs to reach either a particular group of people so we do some stuff with young adults, we do some stuff with toddlers, we form communities um, around different people groups or different networks, but they all embody those values of God's story I've shared, but they're each expressed, obviously in diversity, because these people are all different. And in each case, we train people into the, into the communities that they're trying to reach. And if they haven't got a clue, we don't, we don't care. We just say, have an open heart and we'll train you. And we do the training through Forge, and we do the training through other organizations. So that's how it works with every community that we've planted, and that's what we do. We do the training to live out those values and make it contextually and culturally appropriate. And that's big learning curves for all of us, and we're just learning along the way. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you kind of touched on several questions that, that I want to ask you. So one of them was, how many communities have you have you been involved in pioneering? And when we talk, when you say you planted churches in Manchester, seven you said, and nine otherwise, is that correct? Um, yeah. um, so would you call them communities? And are they very different from each other? Yeah, I mean, even the seven that are in Manchester um, are all different. They're completely different. They're not, they share the same values because we've made them interconnected. And so one of the things in the doctrine of creation, the story of God, is that everything's interconnected. All of creation is a complex interconnection. And we know this more scientifically, don't we, that actually there's such an interconnection of creation. So it's amazing scientists are now, you know, saying more than ever before, the world is really dependent upon its interconnection. Well, yeah, God's made it that way. <laughs> so we create interconnection, interdependence, but it means those interdependent realities our interdependence are things like um, values, maybe some doctrinal core, an independence, or an interdependence of sharing maybe resources, sharing some people, but each are independent in what they look like. They have their own form. So we call ourselves independent, interdependent communities. Well, we say that internally behind the scenes. We don't, that doesn't go on a sign. We just, <laughs> each one's got a name, each one's got a name. So we just have different names. So we have an arts and crafts community and it's simply called Create because that's a good name to call that community. So we share the values, each one shaped differently and they're usually planted by three or four people that I now train and release. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's the main thing that we do and that's the, whole, that's the whole way in which we are connected by which we're also diverse. Mm -hmm. Good. And so you, you mentioned specifically that you um, work with young adults. Uh, yeah. So how do you identify these young adults that, that you build your communities with? And, uh, and obviously you, you train them as well. Could you just give us a little insight? Okay. Well, um, um, I basically find them. I try and find them or God sends them mysteriously to me. So, but, uh, so give an example, there's a girl who's now working for us. In fact, she's going to take over the lead of one of our church plants um, with her husband, Tom. In fact, they're both going to do co-leading. And um, I basically was praying for a young adult couple who could help me in a particular community working with young adults. So, um, you know, young adults include some students, but also wider singles and, and young adults. In a particular community in South Manchester were young adults we're 40 percent of the population i thought we got to do something there so i thought obviously being my age i'm so decrepit i can't possibly do it so i said but i could coach young adults and so um so my young son at 21 he's a young adult and then we coached him and he's helping in another evangelical church in manchester so i just prayed and then this girl called kirsty um contacted me the next day and just came to see me um at college where i was teaching 
And she said, God's told me I've got to speak to you because I've got to give my life to three years into something that you want to share with me. I said, Kirsty, you're going to be a young adults pastor. You're going, to, you're going to help me plan a young adults church. You're going to be the leader of it. And she said, well, what about my boyfriend? And I kind of felt God had told me they were going to get married. But I didn't say that to her then in case I got that wrong. But actually, three years into that, they did get married. They uh, were appointed as um, co-leaders um, about uh, a couple of months ago. And so what we did was, that was just one example of the miraculous that we identified a community that needed someone to reach. God brought me a couple as I prayed for a couple. Don't underestimate, honestly, prayer. Me and Colin Barron, some people here will know Colin Barron. We're also a great believer of we'll go and find as many people as possible. So once we got two leaders, I then found five other leaders because I obviously did some work at a college where I do with students. So I put a note in the bulletin and saying, if you're a student, if you want to be caught up in the greatest adventure of life and you've got a couple of years to give, you've got to come and see me. And five students came to see me. I didn't do a big interview. I just said, come along and see what we're doing. And actually, um, Tom and Kirsty and I developed this team. And three out of those five adults are in the core team now. And they're actually also leaders. So beg, borrow, maybe not steal. Ask God to release them from places where they're doing nothing. And we just find ways of finding people. And I think that one of the things about someone who I think starts something is usually very good at just being able to be a you know, infectious. That's just, I work with maybe 200 pioneers in different denominations across the world. And the one thing a pioneer has in common is they're able to get other people to come and help them. And I, I think that if someone's starting a church and they're not a pioneer person like that, they need to get someone who can bring people. And so me and Colin believe in what we call the big ask. We, if we ask 200 people to come and help us, we make it four. And we'll do it through adverts or we'll do it through prayer or we'll do it by just saying to someone, like, do you want to give your life to something that's great? Do you want to be a cosmic transformation person? Yeah. Why don't you come and do this? Some work, some don't work. But if you ask nobody, nobody's going to come. Yeah. That's how we get them. Good. And obviously you, you were talking about young adults. What about, you know, a few of us who are not so young yeah. anymore? How do you, <laughs> how do you well, go about that? Do you, obviously you would, have, um, you would have leaders who are not. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. I have a great, I, have a, I do have a passion for bringing young adults through into leadership development. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things God put in my heart. Um, when I reached the age of 40, which is nine years ago, um, I felt God say to me, raise up the next generation. So I deliberately, the last nine years, have been particularly coaching young adults to bring them through, you know, Moses bring through Joshua, et cetera, et cetera. Elijah bring through Elisha. So that's why I'm talking about young adults. Um, so what we do with a lot of older adults is we ask them to be mentors and coaches to invest in the next generation. We also, of course, need older um, people um, to be engaged in ministry and mission too. So a number of our communities, like some of our cafe communities, um, in fact, even in the Broad Oak School, we needed people who had kind of wisdom and experience. So our Broad Oak team has a couple of young adults, not surprised, a couple of children's workers, and a few um, senior adults who are just fantastic at hospitality and generosity. And you see that reflects the generational approach to that particular community, you know, children, moms and dads, and particularly in an, uh, an Islam context, the extended family is the most important thing. So what we needed was grandparents, what we needed was people that were uncles and aunts. So what we try and do is find where best do people fit, what's their gifts, what's their shape, Where's their passion? We try and dovetail all that together so that everyone has a place where they can, everybody can be involved in church planting. I do call them kind of communities. I call them communities because church is a loaded word for a lot of people, but I'm not frightened to call it church planting, hence the title. Of, you know, I'm not against the word church. And I love church. I love church as a concept, but I just kind of think what we're trying to do is create communities. And the reason I do that, which maybe for another webinar sometime, is that this creator God is essentially communitarian. God is essentially a community. And so God is about setting up a community patterned after his own community. And so what we try and say, that's form essentially Trinitarian communities. So I like the name community more than church because church actually only is essentially a community. Mm -hmm. So whatever we're planting, we're planting 
communities of creativity, hospitality, communities of blah blah blah. Could you just could you just give us a little kind of a little picture of choose one of your community groups, your yeah. community, and just give us a little bit of more kind of a picture. How does it work? So so in like when do you meet? What do you do when you meet? Who, who is doing what? That that kind of thing. So I'll let's take um let's take our work in Costa in Didsbury suburb of Manchester. It's one of the cafe cultures of Manchester. So that's why we're going to do hip hop church. No, that's why we're going to do cafe church, right? So everything has to marry the context. It can't be alien. If people have to leave their culture at the door, it ain't going to work. Yeah. Okay, that's really important. So one of the things that we did was we walked around the streets. That's another thing we do. We walked around cafe culture. We sacrificially for Jesus, we um, drunk coffee in the 24 coffee shops for about two years. You know, so um, it had 24 coffee shops in a space of a half a mile. So that was cafe culture. So then what we did is we just began to think about which cafe could we choose. It's a long story, but God took us to, um, to premises that became Costa Coffee. And the reason we went for Costa Coffee is because in Britain, the directors are um, Christians. Yeah. We got in touch with the directors. They said, if you want to start a Christian community there, we'll support you. So we got a manager. You know, it's a long story, but it's a miracle that we got there. So we just kind of went in there and we had, I brought together two young adults. Our theme here, two young adults, a few people that love coffee as a passion. It was their lifestyle. And uh, we got together and we began to dream and say, what would, what would it look like to work in a coffee shop? Like, what would worship look like here? And of course, it didn't mean standing up. And so when we went to lots of coffee bars across the city, we saw a lot of acoustic music, sitting down, relaxed, a lot of background information, a lot of background music. So we kind of thought, whatever we do, we need to do um, acoustic music. So we began to do things that we call like live at Costa. And we do youth live at Costa. And so what happens is we had open mic nights where the whole thing was around acoustic music because acoustic music in a cafe shop is not odd. It's natural. It's what people do. And not a big 10-piece band or a big Hillsong thing. Not against Hillsong. Yeah, actually, I am against Oh, I should have said that. Sorry. I'm not a Hillsong fan. But actually, you know, um, it's just because they're all pretty and I'm so ugly. And um, so, but, you know, a guy and a girl on guitar singing naturally fits in a coffee shop. And so we began to do that. And then what we found was they could talk about their songs. We began to then get Christian artists we could interview about their music. And so therefore we had some storytelling that fitted very natural. And so through a process of kind of what is working in a coffee shop, we develop things like, and here's just some things, you live at Costa, where young people come an open mic night, we come and tell a youth story with a youth Christian artist who tells their testimony and we say, do you want to know more about Jesus? We run a cafe church that actually is basically a question of, they, they kind of do a cafe quiz. We have um, a bit of fun around tables. We interview someone, someone gives a thought for the day. We sing a couple of kind of Christian songs. People can join in or not join in. We say a prayer and say, do you want to know more about us? Then come to our conversations at Costa which is something that takes place like on a Tuesday night. Just come and join us for conversations about God and we'll just discuss with you. So Live at Costa takes place several times a week. Um, it's actually taking place as I speak, down in the coffee shop. We run Sunday afternoon because that was the most popular time that people went to get a coffee. It, we, kids were there, families were there. So we just go in and we do live music and we give a thought for the day. The thought for the day we call Tuning Into Life. Because we thought, that's a good name for a coffee, tuning into life. And in Britain, we watched, um, uh, last thing I'll say, um, another thing we do, just to give you an example of what we do in Costa, it's one of our little communities, one of our God communities. A few years ago, there was this TV program in Britain called An Audience With. And um, the famous host would bring a really, another celebrity in, would have an audience in the, uh, you know, with this person. And the audience would sit and watch. I, kinda, I was watching and think, how can we do that in Costa? So I came up with the idea of a coffee with. And what I did in this community was I invited all of the local charities to come and say, did they want to showcase who they were? A coffee with mind, because we support mental health. A coffee with, you know, 
um, Francis House, which is a children's cancer charity. Now, the thing I say is, all of these charities were in the same streets as the coffee shops, uh, but they all were for good causes. So we thought, let's do a kingdom thing. And once a month, we bring a people in, coffee costs to pay for the coffee because we're doing a kingdom thing. And these people come and do kingdom work. And we say, we showcase a cost, a, you know, a coffee with. And we give the organization a showcase and we say, look, do you want to partner with that? Because this is a good thing, saving children's lives, working with poverty, helping mental health. And I'm thinking, these are all the creation things. These are things for life. So every week in Costa, we do four or five things. And church looks like all of those things. All of those things are our aspects of um, what it means to be a community, from music to conversations to actually talking about ways in which we can transform the world. So Costa now consider us basically their church and we consider them our coffee shop. <laughs> that is a good way around. Yeah, I think it's the way it should work. <laughs> well, we, are, the we run that, we run the, yeah, we run that community and it costs us no pennies. You don't yeah. need money, you don't need money to form communities. You just need vision, mm. heart and I think some guts to go and have a go. Yeah, and so, so we are nearly at the end. Could yep. you just tell us, once you form a community, how do you bring people along? So, people so we have an intention. Yeah, sorry. So the go two ahead. things we, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, we, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's just <laughs> a delay. I'm going to shut up until you finish. <laughs> I have finished. <laughs> okay. So there's different things we do with people coming along because we are interconnected communities. So we have, you know, we have a little bit of strategy where we, we developed our strategy through all our mistakes. Okay. We didn't get this great big thing from God. We said, here's all the things that aren't working. How can we make them work? Because we're interdependent, com interdependent communities. I then someone say to the, all the young artists, why don't you come down to Costa? I say to people in Costa, why don't you go here? So we interconnect people relationally because relationships are the most important thing. So we always have other communities that people can go to and that way we build a core. And as we build a core, we just ask them to bring friends to the various things we do. So that's way in, way in which uh, people generally come, word of mouth or by specific interest in the thing that we've created. So when we do create, people that are arts and stuff, they bring other arts people and we encourage them to come. But we interconnect our community so there's always somewhere else to go. In each of the communities, there's a place to explore discipleship. And so that's how people are taken to a deeper level. It's through explorations of conversations. So in all of the different communities, people are exploring faith. Maybe that might happen in a home or it might happen in the venue that we hire out or run or whatever. So people come to us in different ways, but we intentionally develop them through a process that is about three words. They, they're contacts, then they become people that we nurture and then people that we develop. So we have a relational process in every community, contact, nurture, develop, contact, nurture, develop. And what we're doing with everything we're doing, we're constantly contacting, we're constantly nurturing, and we're constantly developing because that's, that, that's how you develop a relationship. And so we're about creating relationships through that sociological process. And that happens everywhere. And then we interconnect the different relationships across our communities. Brilliant. At the, at the end, could you please recommend some books or material or something that people can, websites, anything that people can go to and, and you know, have a look and learn a bit more and explore? So I should say, um, if people Google Forge England and Wales, um, that's, I, I am the director of that. That's not really a promotion. Yeah, it is. No, but actually on that, we just stick articles. We, we stick up training opportunities. We stick up stories. And so people can get that if they do Forge England and Wales. And if people, I'm happy for people to contact me to say, you know, um, so my email address is Trevor Hutton, T-R-E-V-O-R-H, U T T O N at B T Internet dot com. If anybody wants to drop me a line to say, you know, can you recommend ten books or whatever, then I can do that. I can send bibliographies and all that stuff and through teaching and training. Mm -hmm.